Oi, 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 oi. We will record and see if we get it. Okay. Yeah, if, if the painting doesn't turn out, we're going to uh, abandon the recording, make sure <laughs> no one knows it ever happened. Yeah, right, right. Uh, just like any mistakes ever created in our <laughs> videos, make sure it never happens. Uh, you won't see me uh, personally in there, but uh, I am here and I am. Uh, I, started a, a, a little bit of a pre uh, uh, planning for the, the painting. Uh, I haven't done any drawing, but just to kind of give you an idea of what my palette looks like. Uh, this is one of those new wave palettes, which uh, I think are pretty amazing. Uh, and and it, for just for scale, you know, sorry, uh, me versus the size of the palette, it's clearly in the way of a lot of things, but it's, it's rather large. And as a painter, I think that is especially useful for uh, oil and even plein air painters of having the largest mixing area possible uh, to do work on before the paint strokes actually get applied to the surface. Uh, so I've, I've just observed uh, the still life and, and found colors that uh, I personally think are going to be useful for painting this painting. Uh, and these are not exaggerated, at least to me, uh, more so or more than what I'm looking at. So a lot of these colors I'm identifying uh, in the still lives, for example, like on this side of here, these are shadows on the tablecloth uh, created by the aloe plant or the egg. I have some whites in here that look reminiscent of the whites that I'm going to be using for uh, areas of light. Uh, greens, obviously, with the aloe, these kind of two kind of terracotta colors for the, the pot itself. And I have this kind of nice deep dark. Uh, I've actually, that one I actually have exaggerated because the backdrop uh, is this kind of black cloth, which doesn't have any color whatsoever. And rather than just using kind of a black paint, I decided to add a little bit of a, a color to the the, uh, the black to make it a little bit more interesting. And it may actually end up being a little bit cooler in the final painting. This looks a little too warm as it is. Uh, but this is kind of a normal starting point for me as a painter, uh, regardless of the subject matter. Um, but especially if you are a plein air painter, I, I strongly recommend mixing ahead of time if you have oil paints at your disposal rather than drilling. But if you're working in oil and you do that preliminary painting on your palette before you actually put it to the surface of the, of the canvas, I think that actually speeds up the process. So while it may feel to you like you're wasting a half an hour of not painting while this, you know, while ever, all your studio mates or all your classmates are setting up their easel and have already begun painting and you're, you have a blank canvas but your palette is full of paint, to me that's that's okay. I, I think a lot of the planning a lot of the painting process begins on the surface of your palette uh, and then um, gets moved, it gets transported to your actual surface. Uh, in terms of my surface, speak of the devil, uh, I'm working on pan. So you can notice I have color on here. That's actually an old painting that I just either got tired of or you know, seen the studio for a long time and it wasn't doing anything. So uh, the nice part about candle is I can just sand it down and start over again. Uh, so this is a, a these are probably uh, just paint splot, uh, splotches from a previous painting that just didn't work out. Uh, hopefully they won't interfere with the final painting that I'm working on today, but you know, painting on top of an old oil painting is never a bad thing, uh, as long as it's thin enough and it's not still wet. Uh, but these are just uh, an MDF board or hardboard. Uh, and if you're purchasing this in the, in the uh, art store, uh, Ampersand makes them. Uh, I actually make my own uh, in the studio. So these are just uh, kind of a cradled pine, uh, the MDF board, and I run a wire through it. So uh, when it's finished, it can just be hung up on a wall uh, and ready to sell. Or if you're in like a plein air kind of situation, just hung up right on the wall and the buyer will take it home with it, hopefully. So that's my service. And I usually put about, mm, ideally it's about five layers of gesso uh, on a panel, uh, sanded between each one ideally. Uh, I think the smoother the surface for at least for me uh, is better. Um, just feels better to me. A lot of people have different preferences for their surface and the painting technique that I'm going to be doing today, it doesn't really matter. But what I like about working on panel uh, in specific is if I do make a mistake, all I need to do to kind of erase that mistake is take paper towel and, and remove it. And I'm sure that'll happen at some point. Okay. Uh, also, what's kind of different about my uh, setup, at least, is uh, I have attached magnets. Ooh, you can see my reflection. Um, magnets to my palette, so uh, my palette knife is easily at, uh, at my ready. I also make sure that I have paper towel attached here, so I can wipe down the brushes. 
I, I notoriously do not wash my brushes. They just sit in a uh, tank of oil. Uh, when they're not in use, they're suspended, so the brushes are not uh, bent by any stretch. But uh, when I got back from Japan, I painted a painting, and I have not washed these oil brushes since uh, last September. Wow. So people are always like, well, you know, I don't like the solvents in oil painting. Well, me neither do I. It's like the most dangerous aspect of oil painting. So, you know, cleaning your brushes is the largely the, lar uh, the most you are experienced and submitted to uh, these uh, uh, toxic solvents. So if you can avoid that, great. And I think I kind of started doing that when uh, Jackson was born. Wanted to make sure that he wasn't exposed to a lot of solvents. Yep. And your brushes are clean enough to sort of yeah. to, uh, you just wipe them with a towel, right? When yeah. you take them out. Yeah. Oil. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they'll have a little bit of the residual painting from before, but mm -hmm. I think I can clean the brushes with the oil before I start painting. And I have a horrible habit, but it does work for me of, of cleaning my brushes with paint. Uh, so what that means okay. is if I'm transitioning from one uh, color of my palette to another, I'll kind of clean my brush with like white paint, for instance, if I'm going from, a, from this color to that color, I'll just take white paint and clean it off to the side and then I'll, it will be closer to that color. Uh, I don't advise it, but it, it does speed up the process really yeah. quickly. Right. Uh, Jordan, well, Jordan, yeah. when you say in oil, what kind of oil? Right. Is it oh, oil? sorry. The, what, uh, the oil I'm using to clean my brushes with is the same that I suspend the brushes in, so I don't have to clean them. Oh. And anything that is like a poppy seed, sack flower oil, takes oh. time. those take forever to dry. Okay. Those are going to be your best bets to suspend your oh. brush. Household, household oils, okay. Uh, well, I buy mine from the art store. Yeah, I, I just think that if, if, if I'm going to have residual yeah. oil on the end of my brush, I want it to be archival. Um, right. And a lot of those oils that you would use in salad dressing, for instance, have the fats or right. health reasons. Right. And for art stores, they remove those those fats so they're not going to rot on your canvas. So I actually buy um, uh, those oils, uh, you know, from I think Holbein does a lot of large containers of safflower oil. Uh, I was lucky enough to find poppy oil in uh, uh, Japan, so I clean my brush. One, <laughs> I clean my brushes once in Japan over the three-year time, and that oil was still like exactly the same as when I first bought it when I had to dispose of it. Uh, but yeah, poppy oil is just amazing. Perfect. Yeah, poppy seed oil. Any other questions at this point before I start? All right. Cool. Uh, so. Uh, it, the, the name of the game for this, at least for me today, is going to be speed. So I'm really not even going to bother drawing a whole lot. And if I am going to be drawing, I'll be drawing with the color that I need to actually be in that location. Uh, so my brushes, I have a variety, I'll show you what I'm working with. Uh, I have uh, some very small brushes, I have some wide brushes. Uh, these are all either synthetics or sables. So I have some uh, old sables from uh, probably about seven or eight years ago uh, that. Um, they were on sale. They were beautiful brushes. I don't think they still make them anymore, but the Creative Mark made some, uh, um, some sable brushes for about you know, $10 to $20 each, and I just snagged them up, uh, and they've been great. So uh, that's kind of what I'm working with. I end up using probably the, the large to the mid brushes for the most part of the painting. Uh, and honestly, the smallest, smallest brushes that I have uh, in my hand here, uh, they're not going to be probably at all featured today with painting, but we'll see. Well, let's get started. Uh, to kind of get going on here, I hope you can kind of see where my brush is. Uh, but I, I, I'm looking at kind of the edge of the of the terracotta pot here. And this is the edge on the left hand side and at the, at the top here. Now I'm going to grab this kind of beautiful black color that I have pre mixed. Let me actually add a little bit of blue to it because the more I stare at it, the more I think it needs to be a cool black rather than a warm black. So I'm going to just go ahead and add some ultramarine to it. Right. Great right when you bring your palette to Florida, right. if you can. Yeah. I'll remind you every now and then. Yeah, the nice part about the new palette is that um, it doesn't feel odd holding up for a long period of time. It does, oh, that's great. It, it's pretty lightweight, all things considered. I'm just looking at the outside edge of this kind of terracotta pot. This is like the negative spaces for you guys. And I'm trying to kind of gauge, like, if I'm looking from my standpoint, if I'm standing up, my brush going across. Where the pot is on my 
canvas and where it is in real time space is lined up on the same horizontal axis. So that when I when I side measure the height of the of the terracotta pot and I side measure it on my canvas, they line up on the same horizontal axis. So the bottom of it is probably going to be back here. It's not very tall pot on my canvas. Let me make it a little bit bigger actually. For everyone, remember that Jordan is very tall, so he's looking <laughs> at it from above where you are. Yeah. Mess up a little bit more than this so one. And where, where a paint stroke stops for me, uh, or where a color stops for me, is when it runs into something where it's a change. But the negative space here, I don't want a whole lot going on here. So this is kind of where that green stem starts right back here. But I don't want my background to be too involved. And if, it, if I need to be more involved later on, I can always make it more involved. You can actually see this line here is actually that stem that's sticking up there. But let's go ahead and add more. I'm going to ditch that brush for now. I'm going to look at kind of what I'm wearing here. And I have this beautiful kind of white, creamy color that is the rim of the, of the uh, terracotta pot here. And it actually doesn't show up too well. So I, I think I'm going to just say that's enough that it's a, the color of the canvas here, at least on my, my surface, it doesn't show up very much. Let's go ahead and actually have dirt next. I feel like Bob Ross here. So I'm happy with dirt. I'd also advise not to drink a whole lot of coffee before you paint because my hands are very good. <laughs> really. Bad. All right. Make it a little bit of correction with the white a little bit. And that same white I'm going to actually use as the front of the pot too. So I'm, I'm making sure that all my colors are linked together. Because the way I judge the success of a color is how it relates to what's next to it. I'm going to avoid that crack for just now for a little bit. Get a crack in my rim of the pot there. Questions again? I have this kind of terracotta color that kind of dips down. Each, each brush stroke relates to the one next to it. So I'm looking at this shape, it is a triangular shape created by this aloe stem that's coming right across my line of vision right here. It's going to be different for the still if you guys are observing as well, but it, it extends all the way to about here. And that paint stroke is going to occupy that space. So I'll add, add my little shadow right there too. Now I can't hop over here. Why, why can't I just skip that and just say it's good spec and move this color over here? I really shouldn't do that in this in theory because I want to make sure that this color is observed next to this green. Without that green, I don't know if this terracotta color is actually 100% accurate. So I really want to make sure that this color is um, going to be accurate in relationship to that kind of greenish color. But before I go on, I think I want to pour that up just a little bit. I think when I move my surface, I move the light. Hold on a second. That's not okay. That's still okay? Yeah. Yeah. I can adjust the so we'll do that. Oh, good. That's my terracotta shape. We brush for my green. And like Kermit the Frog says, it's not easy being green. It's not easy painting green either. This is my stem. It, it continues down pretty far, but I just really wanted to uh, relate to the terracotta color. A little bit of a highlight there. I'm going to skip that because the light surface will actually do its job now. Now that I have that green. Go ahead and move to the other side. Here's that same terracotta color. The brush was the same one that I used before. It had lay in that shape that is the, the terracotta color. I'm looking at it as a, a pure shape, I'm not thinking about what it is and thinking about the shape of it. Cool. Now, this side of it, it actually extends in real life to about here. This 
to be the, the darker value. So I'm going to actually grab my color, grab it, grab it when I pre-mix, see if it's going to work out. This is the shadow color it's down the side. Hopefully it reads for you guys as a darker color. I do have some nice, beautiful window highlights right on the side here. We're going to try and have a little bit of the blue from uh, the tablecloth that I have over here. See if I can slide that in right on the edge. So far, so good. Pull away from it. Okay. I can actually switch back to my black here. Just the my background color is actually finished off the drawing. So this actually will get the both the the, um, the rim of the pot, the tabletop, and I can relay it to my terracotta color here. So it's a really important negative shape that I'm looking at here. It goes all the way up and touches the top of my uh, aloe that's going across here. So this shape is going to occupy quite a bit. Puzzle pieces, right? Now I can still change this. It does look a little warm. I'm actually at Carol Marie related to that. But I don't like it. It's purple, not blue. I can either go to this screen here, which is going to our plant, or I can start laying down some of the shadow colors here on the table. I'll go with the shadow colors. So premixed on my palette here, I did some premixing earlier, uh, and I have this kind of pretty vibrant blue that I'm going to work with. I'm going to see if it works for the painting. Uh, typically, I, I, if I, the color doesn't feel right, um, once I lay it down, I, I try and change it. I don't let it sit there for too long. It's going to affect a lot of things in the painting. And that color actually shifts quite a bit. It has, this is a little bit too dark for that location. It's actually closer to right where the pot uh, um, where I have like a split shadow, so the shadow has two different values. So it belongs here, but it doesn't belong up here. So I'm going to actually take kind of the version that I have right next to it. You can kind of see I have two versions of that color. I'm going to see if I can kind of find what I did to that color, which is a little bit of gray actually, and add that directly into that color that I have before. If that doesn't work, I would just remove the color with a paper towel and start over again. Shadow color extends all the way to my head, which may be hard for you guys to see. Sorry about that. The keg's face is back here in, the, in my canvas. They are seeing it in the second okay. screen. So cool. Right there. And that shadow can extend all the way. This, this one actually links up with the screen that I have here, uh, which may be off. Let's see for a minute. Yeah, it probably lines up back here in the inner campus. But I don't want to go that far out from my, 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 my setup. Does your color might change as you get there? Yeah, my eyes will adjust and I'll see things differently. Um, I'll identify colors that I did before. Uh, there's actually a little bit of green that's reflected from the aloe on the white pot that I didn't make a mixture of earlier, uh, but I'm wishing I had because it's beautiful. And there's no reason I, I can't mix that now. So I'm going to go ahead and take my palette knife. This one's actually pretty close. I actually may use this egg color and adjust it from my aloe color. So I'm actually pulling some of the color from my aloe mixtures and moving it into my kind of uh, egg color. So this kind of greenish shadow color is a good place to start. A little bit of black. A little bit cerulean. See if that how that's going to look. So I, I take the back of my knife once it's mixed, and I hold it up to the actual thing I'm looking at. And see how close, or maybe if I want to exaggerate a color, making that comparison before I actually move it to the surface of my my uh, camera. So here's a good way of cleaning my brush. 
going from one color to another. This is actually my background brush, but I want the size of it because I like the size. And uh, because I'm a bad uh, you know, instructor, when I say do as I say, not as I do, uh, I'm cleaning my brush with white paint that moves it closer to the color that I want. Okay. And it has that Don't very do that. dark background <laughs> color. Yeah, I'm just being, and I can go back to the, the uh, the black pretty easily too, but I also hold my brush a little bit differently. You know, typically painters when they paint, they're 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 pushing the brush bristle down on the surface and giving it a lot of pressure, and that creates that paint stroke. I typically hold it sideways and I set the paint on the surface. So in all the prima, if I don't want that transparency to work out, if I don't want it to come through uh, in the in the in the painting, then I have to have a denser paint of that transparency. So I set the paint on there. So Painted on there. Yeah, I think that's a nice color. There's a bit of a shadow on the uh, on that rim, so I'm going to go ahead and add that uh, highlight actually to separate that out. It'll probably show up once there's light on the screen. But I can actually hold you. Oh, that's wonderful. So here's where I am right about now. So I don't know if you guys can see the kind of greenish color on the white, but that's what it looks like. If you'd like, we can take a screenshot too. Or not. <laughs> well, you painters, make sure that your painting is always at high level, not below, not too high, not too low, but right around your eye level. I think that's an important practice to have. Okay, so back to my tablecloth here. Uh, that kind of color that I have here, which is, let's see if I can show you, uh, kind of a eggy blue, kind of white. It's not white, even though this tablecloth is white, it's gray, uh, but it's kind of a muted one. And I'm, what I want to do is actually paint around the egg, which is going to occupy the space right here. So I have a nice dialogue between the two objects here. But I'm using this color to kind of carve out. There's that residual. Uh, carve out the uh, the egg in a way. So I hold my brush sideways and lay that color in. And then make a comparison between that and my shadow. A lot of times people ask, you know, how do you know how much color to mix ahead of time? I don't. But I think that's important that it's just practice to mix these colors over and over again. I don't mind the mixing of colors over and over again. I think that's a healthy practice and um, if I can't mix it again, well, then it was never meant to be. So top of my eggs back here. So this is where it'll go. Looking at that little shape between the back of the of the table and the top of the egg. That's what I'm carving out. Now I'm looking at the shape between the shadows from the aloe plant side of the egg. And I'm trying to match that shape with a brush stroke as best I can. Yep, this is where the egg will go. But did any paint for the egg. It's just the table uh, surface that I have it now. But just to make sure that I'm on the right path, I'm going to pop over to the other side here of the, of the uh, terracotta pot. There's a shadow that's very, very faint, but it's basically created by uh, probably the windows actually and the terracotta pot. So it's actually kind of a warmth to it. So again, one of those, those things that you just find as you're painting that maybe ahead of time you didn't see it right off the bat, but uh, as the paint progresses, you do notice uh, it. So I'm going to add a little bit of warmth to that shadow, that side here. And it goes all the way down to the, uh, the aloe branch that I started. But on either side of it, it's the color that I used over here. I refresh my blue. Now, I haven't added any medium to my paint is strictly just the um, pure oil paint and maybe a little bit of oil from uh, my brush when I started out. 
but not a whole lot. That same color pops up again. I also mixed right there, so I mix remix that color. Mm -hmm. We're going to leave a gap over <laughs> Here's that shot of these two. I mean, I like to my door to be usually not draw and it just start with the paint. Uh, it depends on how complex the subject matter is. Mm -hmm. If I'm dealing with a really complex subject, uh, you know, architecture, for instance, mm -hmm. I find it sometimes it's beneficial to go ahead and uh, do some sketching, do some drawing, mm -hmm. uh, the place where things go. Uh, this is a pretty, uh, not too comp complicated, it's still a uh, so I don't mind just jumping right into it, hoping for the best. I also think this is, is pretty useful as a, uh, for a technique. Uh, if, if, if I was in a situation like a plein air situation where the light is constantly changing, uh, the faster I can paint, the more accurately uh, it will turn out. That way, I'm not painting against the sunlight. So I'll change that a little bit. Oops. And then I want to point out that you are not against using a pre-mixed gray, like a Portland gray. I have pre-mixed gray on my palette, but I still use that gray for other things. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm not. I'm not using it straight out of the tube. Uh, it's rare that it, I find. Right. Yeah, it's rare that I find that the, the gray will actually be perfect the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, happens but I, I find it at least with abstract painting if I um, run into a situation where I don't know what a color is I often just place gray there as a placeholder uh, what that does for me is it just gray can kind of be anything and it often will tell you the the artist what actually belongs there um, I think that's kind of a, a nice kind of gift that gray would give you Great one, not a great one. I know the kind of exciting part of the painting, but the reason why I did this painting I like how the shape form. Mm -hmm. I don't think I need to have a, a whole lot of volume quite yet. Uh, it may end up being just fine as a, as a purely flat shaped painting, but we'll see. There's two different strands here. So I'm going to need my, my dark color again to separate the two right here. Because the gap between these two guys is this black color. But I do want this color to go off, off the out. That's this weird paley yellow color. And the one that's coming forward is a little bit more green. And it actually comes out the bottom, probably right in the corner. So I'm actually going to stop painting the aloe because I really don't want it ending in the corner of my, my, my uh, camera here. Uh, that's kind of a composition uh, disaster. So be aware. So I hope we did a nice shot of this coming forward. I think I need my negative space for so I'm going to strip it from the white that I was using earlier. Best I can with a paper towel, which is just going to pull in the paint out with it. I'm actually going to take pure black paint, just wipe it off. So I can get as much of that white that I was using earlier. To go away. A smarter painter would actually just have two separate brushes, one dark, one light, but here I am. Carve out that angle shape. Should give me the kind of a feel for the top of that strand of aloe. Give me the top of these guys. And also the separation as well. Okay, that's the next 
Nico shapes, or at least the background Nico color, is nice for correcting any pain errors that we did along the way earlier. So I'm noticing some lines that kind of change now when I have this color kind of carved them out. Makes the adjustments to the painting. Hesitant to just fill in this whole corner because I do like unfinished look to the painting. And if I have it finished everywhere around in the corners, it does kind of make it more to uh, more in the family of a paint that needs to be filled in rather than just left unfinished. So I really wanted to kind of start from one location and expand. You know, think about like uh, a nexus point where all your shapes and all your different colors kind of come from. So I, I, I'm hesitant to just fill stuff in. Rather, just kind of incrementally add stuff as it as it goes. All right, it's time for the egg. Woo. Looking at how I carved it out earlier with the uh, nickel shapes, and if I want, if I'm a little concerned about how wide I'm going to make that egg, I, want, I can just find a comparison between two. So if I measure the width of the egg on the horizontal, and it's just sighted versus my ceramic plot that I've already drawn, the width is about from the aloe to the end there. So my width of my egg probably ends about here. So I know that in my painting, that shadow will pop up on the other side of the egg about here. And I can check the bottom of the two. I can actually create a horizontal plumb line, which lines up at the bottom of the egg. And I'm actually just looking at the negative space between that horizontal plumb line and the bottom of the pot. That makes sure that my egg doesn't go too low on my, my panel uh, uh, in relationship to the bottom of that ceramic pot. So there's just a pair of a, 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 a distance there. About there is the bottom. So I can go ahead and put that cast shadow uh, to create the egg itself. And even just that cast shadow alone should give me a pretty good feeling for how that looks. I'll go ahead and move the surface of the panel closer to the camera. So, so you can see that you don't really need a whole lot to paint something. So see how the egg is created? I have actually, there's no paint on the egg itself. It's just the shadows uh, around it there, there, and there. That actually creates almost the illusion of the egg itself. This goes to show you it's not what you paint, it's what you don't paint. Like to ask. It's such an important message that I think there's a, a natural tendency to fill a service and right. make sure that everything's there, do your checklist and so forth. And honestly, like if you look at some of those um, low paintings uh, or uh, the, like the teeth paintings, there's not a whole lot that you need to make a good painting. You just need a, a few well placed color strokes uh, and then do it. Let's go ahead and get that table edge. That's way too dark. That's a good example of why we use panel, is I can just take that oop, color and just remove it with my paper towel. And it's basically gone. So now that that too dark color is, is removed, I can try again. So let's see, what color is it closest to that area pre-mixed? Uh, this guy down here is actually not a bad front of the table color. So let's see if it works. I don't know if that was my original intention for that color, but it's actually a lot closer to what uh, the front of the table than what I have there. There's some kind of dark colors uh, in this corner that I, I don't think are gonna make the painting any better. So I'm gonna go ahead and just cover them up with this front of the table color. Maybe go off the ball. But always finish it off later. And while I have this color here, there is a kind of shadow on the bottom of the egg, which is similar. If I really observe it, it's kind of like a crescent shape that goes from about here all the way to about there. Uh, this is not, this is probably a little bit too dark for that. I probably need a little bit something, a little bit more purple. Uh, kind of this, this kind of dirty brush that I used, used earlier to clean my brushes is a pretty good candidate. So let's see if it works. We actually add a little bit of magenta to it just to kind of give it a little bit more vibrancy. But 
it doesn't work, I can always remove it. Try again. And that starts at that shadow, and it moves right around the belly, still leaving room for that reflected light on the bottom of the bag. I'm going to really pop up on, uh, on the other side here. So I'm going to go back to my bluish kind of color, which is my table cloth, and I think the rest of the head. Here we're running into an aloe leaf. That shape curls all the way around. I always have my beginning drawings to uh, draw eggs. Uh, they're one of the most difficult things to draw in, in art. Um, painting as well. I'm going to call for a painting there as well. And the reason why that is just such a recognizable shape. And it's it, 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 it's slightly off, the viewer will know. We'll warm up this area a little bit. I just feel like it needs to be warmer. It's coming forward. So anytime you have uh, something you want to come forward, Adding uh, warmer temperatures to it will help. So even though this is a little bit more, no, no, no it is pretty warm here. It's, not, it's cooler, it's warmer than the back here, yeah. visually. I reapply that and maybe go off the page here, just because I had some residual painting from the previous one that was just interfering. So I have to remove it. But that gives me the I'd say the top too. Brush. I do want some color here because I still have some you know, scratches in the surface of my uh, panel that I think adding a little bit of maybe a kind of uh, pinkish color, really, really white pink. So I'm going to actually take pure white paint. Uh, add a little orange to it. See how where the tipping point is where it actually looks less like creamsicle but more like light on an egg. See if it works. Hold your breath. It may not show up on your search on your painting or on your camera. Or I still want to finish these aloes. Let's see that really quick. These guys go off the page. I don't mind that. <clears throat> but at this point, they're not looking at the surface texture um, of the aloe that has these little dots as I look at the yeah. design. It doesn't bother me that they're not there. Right. Um, when I, uh, kind of a cardinal rule for me is that do I see it when I squint? Um, if I don't see it when I squint, then it's not really critical to the success of the painting, in my opinion. Um, it might be like the fun stuff to do, you know, it's like the, right. Uh, but I don't think it's going to make the painting any better by that. Or it's, this is really just about the, the shapes, how things are kind of opposed. Um, if it's if it's interesting to somebody that's you know some people may want those and you know, it's a missed opportunity but for me it's not that important here's kind of one of those situations like everything's there you have the pot i have the aloe uh, there's a few places i could probably re-emphasize some shadows make it a little bit more intense uh everything's there now it's what can i make better is there anything to actually improve on this painting uh, before i can let it uh, just be done uh, probably a little bit more structure. I've lost the edge on the ceramic pot here. Um, I can recreate the highlights on here so it's a little bit more powerful. Uh, so, right now, I don't mind this being what it is. I don't mind this being unfinished in the biggest painting. Even down here, I think there's a few places in these the shadows that I, it's an opportunity to kind of connect this shadow to that, um, that's that stem of aloe. But for the most part, we're, we're near completion on this. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be done uh, with a with few exceptions. Uh, let's start with here. Uh, I want that light on that 
this kind of crest of this owl blend stand out a little bit more. Uh, it's a two-step thing. It's not just adding light to the owl because it's bringing out a little bit lighter than midtone, but it's adding kind of these darker colors around it. So I'm actually going to exaggerate that color again, make it a little bit darker near the top of this owl. That should already start to make that color a little bit brighter as a result. Put it on the other side too. Is it that color in real life? Not really. But is it going to make a better one? Yeah. yeah, this thing just kind of about making a better one. This may be problematic. I'm actually darkening that stem so your eye doesn't go out the top. But we'll see in a minute. If this if this becomes stronger in light source, it may distract the viewer from going out the top. So we'll see. Let's see. Where where the where is that color now on here? That color that I'm using for the aloe plants is about here. Uh, I have this kind of duller green on my palette. Uh, I have cinnabar green up here in the corner here, which might be a fun candidate. It's really intense. It may, may if I just add the pure color overpower the painting. But if I dull it down with some white, maybe even a little cerulean blue to counter, uh, counter the yellow, it may kind of put it in a better family of colors that will act as a highlight of that will be powering the whole thing. Being white and also not being white, right? Yeah, I don't want it to be too strong. So maybe I can just add some texture on that. Maybe it's a little bit brighter. Let's go for it. It's a thick plant. Right. I'm just setting it paint right on the surface there. Runs into the other guy. But now I kind of want to make the one a little bit darker, even though it's not, but just so that step, uh, that one stem stands out more. Because that's a nice, it brings me from the egg area to the uh, to the pot. So I'm actually going to take this color I have right here and darken it a little bit, make it a little bit cooler. So now it's like this critical stage of the thing where. Even though it's not something, it makes a better opinion. It is something. It's at least where that I want that to stand out. It's a nice kind of shadow there. It darkened that up, cooled it down. Is it too strong? Okay. That's better. There's more on the underside of it too. Better, right? Mm -hmm. So you're modulating the Oh. Yeah, making it more interesting. I'm yes. still not, I think I maybe had this um, as thicker, so I'm going to finish that off too. I have to carve it down a little bit. I'll put it from the bottom, chisel it down, so I'm going to grab my black because I, the drawing is not quite right. So I'm going to carve it out rather than it Shape better. It's like, oh, well. this is the white canvas that is not important. I think I will pull that down and make that duller. So let's do that. It's not in real life, but I'm going to make an executive yeah. decision to uh, change the temperature and darken it. So I can see on my palette, I have the green family that I was working with earlier, and I'm actually adding just a lot of swirling blue to it. And start near the base. I just kind of maybe just like pull it or pull, pull that color into it without completely getting rid of it. I can actually just smear it too and make a soft edge. So that's another option as well. And along my paintings, I get to a stage where I have to unpaint things, where it's just too rep representational. And I almost kind of steal from Anne Gale, who's a big hero of mine, where she just kind of takes colors and, and kind of dabbles them into one another. So you'll find the background, the foreground, and the middle ground in the background. And it kind of uh, clouds the, or, or diffuses the, the surface of the painting, makes it more exciting, but also things will start to uh, come forward and backwards at the same time. It's kind of hard to explain it if you don't know her work, but it, it's a nice way to kind of uh, remove uh, remove too much focus in one, in one area. Mm -hmm. So I can actually take some of these darker colors and dabble it into that. But if I if I do it someplace, I have to do it in a lot of places. Darken it up top a little bit. And that 
should go away. So this warm shadow that I reused right there, hope it's still somewhere on brush somewhere. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you want to think about your brushes. <laughs> uh, look at the tip. Right. Hope that you're right. And then I paint on my palette first before I put it on the. I don't, I never put it directly onto the surface. Right. Um, but here's a shot of it, 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 you guys won't be able to see it very much, this, but you'll see it afterwards when I show you up close. A warm, a warm reflection. Light. I don't know how important it is to the success of the painting, but it makes me happy, so I got it. It's visible in the camera a little bit. Really? Yeah. Okay. A little bit. See the war. <laughs> I'm reminded why I teach in person now. There's so much here that I can I see, and I want to talk to, talk and show you guys, but it's just so hard to put the camera. Yes. So, so I'm gonna actually make it a little bit more rounded so it stands out. Ah, right. Maybe too much. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the shadow here I like a lot. I don't want it to be too strong though. So I'm actually gonna break it down and lighten it up. So it's not gonna be continuous. It's gonna kind of like, you know, just be dabbled. It's not even fully uh, painted. A little bit more than that See how many decisions you're making that are not necessarily what you're seeing directly. It's about making better painting. I, I try and include it. If it's in real life, I will paint it. Um, right. But I, after the fact, I'll remove it or change it. Uh -huh. um, I think there's a tendency to overuse your artistic license. <laughs> yes. I don't know how to explain that. I think, yeah. I think nature is beautiful enough on its own. Um, where you don't need to do a whole lot of, of changing to uh, real life. Um, but I think there are opportunities to where you can exaggerate nature um, and adding more blue to that shot so it would be a better painting. Um, uh, I think you exaggerate nature and it just looks a little bit more interesting as a painting. There. I have five minutes to do one piece for Yeah, that'll be a good one. Oh, I'm right. sorry. Oh, that's what I'm doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. It doesn't look great. I know. Hey, you call me. Yeah. I tried to paint it with too big of a brush for really long. Right, right, right. And then I just couldn't get in that space. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here to paint uh, the completion of the painting, and I'll show it to you in just a second. Uh, in the meantime, are there any questions about? Maybe something I didn't do that you're curious about, or um, things like that. I'm gonna check the chat too. Um, I see some uh, camera has lost focus. Oh, artist, did you mention? Oh, um, Anne Gale. Uh, this much is her paint. What was her name? Anne Gale. G A. I think it's G A. G A L E. Uh, yeah, and Gail's uh, a, a all of hero of mine. I do absolutely adore her paintings. She came and talked when I was in uh, undergrad, or no, sorry, grad school in Indiana. She was actually applying for a job there. Uh, in my opinion, I was like, hey, you don't come here. Um, she was better off in Washington State than at the uh, University of Washington. But she she's a little strange in person, but she's an incredible painter. Uh, so I like her work quite a bit. You know where she's based now? 
As far as I know, she's still Pacific Northwest. Uh -huh. I could be wrong though. It's been a while since I looked at her work. No, let's see. Okay, I think uh, I've done enough. Let me put, let me put it that way. So I'll bring it forward. I mean, this is the same kind of approach when I when I uh, teach as a figurative meaning kind of thing. Uh, this is you know in the same vein as um, Velasquez, a sergeant. I mean, they're they're, they're approaching painting the same way, uh, where it's just one paint stroke leads to the next one. So any paint stroke that I placed on here is somehow related to the very first one. It's like a domino effect. Uh, and I think that's important to uh, the process because uh, Richard Schmidt, who's one of those, who's this, Probably the guy who championed this in the current day and age the most. Richard Schmidt is like, my favorite thing that he said is, if I die in the middle of a painting, I want it to look finished. And, and I, <laughs> and it sounds strange, but he's an older guy, so I, I get it. But I, I like that mentality that it's always going to be at a stage where it looks somewhat resolved. And I Jordan, also, Jordan, yes, I'm sorry. Could you hold the painting up and flat to the camera? Thank you. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, Art. that's better. That's much better. Thanks a lot. Yes. Best I can do. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I like the way that Richard Schmidt paints. Uh, his books are insanely expensive, but I think you can find them for free online. Uh, but I do think, uh, as a painter, what he leaves out is just as important as what he paints. Um, so he's, he's just an incredible painter. But it's in the same kind of genre of, of, um, of paintings. But, you know, a little, little study for an hour, but you can see how quickly those, those decisions are made and how quickly the paint strokes are applied. Uh, again, I, I probably spent about 15, 15 minutes painting ahead of time, which is on the palette. So whenever I think about the, this process, it's, it's really just kind of three things. It's mixing the color, which I did, you know, before we, we uh, painted that. Uh, mixing the color, uh, identifying the color or identifying the color, mixing the color and putting it in the right place. So I, I identified the color and I mixed the color. And all I did for you is that last stage of the, of the paint process, which is put it in the right spot. Uh, and there are some adjustments. There are some colors that I am uh, mixing as I go. Um, There's some colors that I saw later on that I didn't identify early on, but that goes for anything. You know, if you stare at a, a corner of a room where it's two white walls coming together, those colors of the white wall are going to change over time. You're going to see new colors the longer you stare at something. So just like in a painting like this, the more I stared at the still life, the more I saw, the more I can kind of decide to make changes or adjustments. Uh, but, you know, we have in the fall coming up here at the art clinic, uh, there are, um, I'm going to actually start uh, with, the, I think it's September 1st-ish, I want to say. We're going to have a plein air just around the park uh, for classes. But then what's really kind of fun is plein air, but with a figure. So we're going to do a figure in the landscape for four classes. And then we'll finish off the fall with four classes of just working in the studio with a figure in this process. Uh, I, I'm hoping that people will do all four, all three classes, which is a total of 12. Uh, but I, I think that process of starting with landscape, yeah. learning how atmosphere is created in this process, then the figure in the landscape, uh, and see how, where to place your focal points, where to add in add uh, uh, details of where to avoid details and then taking the figure back in the studio and still using some of the techniques from plein air in the studio with the figure. I think that's going to be a nice uh, trio of art clinics that we're going to do in the Stone Tower. So in Jordan, they're called Ala Prima, right? Yeah, yes. I think registration for these is going to start on August 2nd. So uh, I expect them to hope they'll fill. Right. I'm really excited about them. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's all I have to say. That's great. If you were to finish it faster, Jordan, and I know that you put the right, the paint in the right spots in the key areas now, um, maybe would you think about either blending some of the background, making it, uh, or not really? You would. I, at it this stage, um, I, I think what happens is at this stage in the, in the painting, I let it sit overnight and then come back to it yeah. uh, the following day. So I think I have enough where I could look at it as a uh, look at it away from the subject matter and make adjustments to the painting. Uh, it may be that I, I think that the dark background actually really needs to be blue and not kind of this purple color. Uh, so there's a lot of things I could change after the fact. But I don't need the still life anymore. I don't need the, the light situation. Uh, but, uh, so hopefully that helps. Okay.
try to come closer so they can see you with it as a painting. So it kind of goes in and out of focus a little bit when you move it. Oh, but that's that just uh, that's just how tech, the tech world. <laughs> Is there any other questions before we call today? Anybody else have questions? I see a chat on. Oh no, they're the chats, the same chats I open. Computer. I have a question. Sorry. What did you say, Rita? The table, your angle in your painting. Yeah. How did you decide that? Uh, that's why I look. I mean, it is. It's slightly receding in space from where mine positioned. Uh, oh, okay. the, this camera here is at a slightly different angle than yeah, mine. Let me, let me just bring uh, it down. So my, my my table is angled from where I'm standing versus. Uh, where the camera is. Uh, I, I think we tried our best to get the Higher angle up. exactly the same, but it really have to be some of those fancy like Google goggles for okay. Yeah, I'm trying to move it to that's all right. I, <laughs> that was a good answer. And what what's that white thing? The egg? <laughs> oh, it's an egg. I, I can't yeah. tell what it is from yeah, it. it's 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 very nondescript, even from where I'm standing. Uh, uh, it has so much direct sun, or not sunlight, but direct light on it that it gets yes. bleached out in both the cameras and from where I'm standing. Right. Uh, so I actually, I only have two paint strokes to represent the entire egg, yes. uh, which is um, an, a, a stroke which I, I, I'm looking at now and saying it didn't even show up, and then the cast shadow on the egg. Right. Uh, so it's, it's barely visible from where I am. Jordan? Yeah. I just had a question. Um, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'm just looking at the shadow on the egg. Of course, we're taught to gradate these shadows. Yeah. And, you know, you didn't. So I'm just curious about that. Uh, I, I mean, I definitely could. Um, I, 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 it, it, I think it's just a matter of like how much is needed to make it turn. Uh, okay. If it, if I come back to it tomorrow and I say well, that needs to have a little bit more volume or, or whatever, right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I could just lighten it up in that corner there. Um, sure. Niggles, you can do it really quick. Um, it doesn't take much. Um, I'm just curious with that, you know, what kind of choice that was for you. Yeah, it's just a, it could be laziness for all I know, but here I'll. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, it, it was the essentials. So. Right, right. It, I mean, it's, it's do I need it or not? Uh, and oftentimes, like, the more I work something, the more it'll actually make the paint worse. So. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, right. It's a question of the essentials. Okay. Uh, and again, if I'm if I'm showing this, you know, I'll put it on oh, the screen. Oh, if, if I'm showing this as like a competition Can between these two, yeah. Well, I don't so want to glare from it. Right. Anyway, if I'm I'm showing the competition between these two objects, I would rather the viewer look at this than that. So, right. so if I do too much information on this egg, then it's going to overpower why I painted this in the first place. Yeah. Great, thank you. That really helps. Yeah. And uh, I'm not opposed to just saying, let's just remove the egg altogether. And I may come back to it tomorrow and say, oh, that egg is just not important to the composition whatsoever. It's really about the relationship between the pot and the aloe, and that's enough. And I yeah. and I, I thought I needed something else originally, but who knows? Right. And that gorgeous sort of cast shadow uh, movement that you had from the aloe. Yeah, I mean the most exciting thing was just the negative shapes and the, and the yeah. shadows. Yeah surface created by the aloe plant uh, the egg was just occupied space really it's to kind of keep me from going out so the lines of these actually its job was to prevent the viewer from continuing over out of the composition the egg pulls you back in and points you back towards the the reason why the painting is created so it really does it's a ground it's a grounding um it's a shape that pulls you back towards why i painted the paint yep but that's its pure job as a shape it, it, i mean it's, it could be a ping pong ball and it would still be fine. <laughs> yeah, but in theory. <laughs> Thank you so much. George. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions before we close out? Yeah, and, and also this is an hour painting, not even an hour painting. No. So it's, you know, you, you have to kind of say like, is this something I'll probably hang on the wall and sell? Probably not, I'll probably scrape this down and just paint it and use it as oh. practice. Um, and that's, I mean, I think that's a healthy mentality. It's like, you know, sometimes they turn out and you just go, wow, this is a great painting. But other times you just have to say, oh, that's a fine painting, but I, I'd rather have the surface again. And that's why this, this probably has about three paintings on it that have been sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's practice, but 
you know, when you have that moment where it clicks, you should know it and it should feel like this is the one that needs to be saved. And yeah. you may not feel that way next year, but you can always. Go. We lost your audio, Jordan. Let me uh, put my, um, can you hear me for a moment? Just wanted to close out. We, we, yes, I, I will we can, thank we can you hear you. Me. Thank you. I, I um, will never forget that when we asked Mary White how many of her paintings she did not proceed to show or sell, she said, uh, I discard 40% of what I paint which was pretty amazing to me. Anyway, have a wonderful week. Join us on Tuesday if you like. Um, and certainly join us next, uh, not next Saturday, but the Saturday after that. Remember, because we do a Saturday and a Thursday in, in sequence quickly, and then we wait two weeks. Oh, Tuesday. I'm sorry, I said, I said Thursday. It's on Tuesday. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice.